It is Wednesday afternoon, June 19th, and we'll be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 45, right at verse 1. We've just come through chapter 44 where uh, Judah has just pleaded because Benjamin has been caught with the silver goblet in his sack. We know that Yosef set him up for that, but he wasn't setting up Benjamin for a fall. He was wanting to find out how the brothers really felt, how they were acting, what life was like. And in the fact that they came as a group, didn't let Benjamin get thrown to the wolves alone, so to speak. They're standing with him. They, they had a chance they could have walked away from him as they did Yosef himself, if that was their heart. But he sees now that, that the heart really has completely changed within his brothers. And with that, he is going to move forward with that great moment where he's going to finally tip his hand as to what has been going on how they were sat according to age, the chance one in 40 million, how all of these events unfolded, it was not by accident. It was not by any other means except by the power of God within Yosef, who had brought him down and set him up for this very time. Brought him to the kingdom for such a time as this, as we say from the book of Esther. So. Knowing that the hearts of his brothers are really changed, he no longer needs to hide his identity. And with that, let's excitedly go into chapter 45 and verse 1. But I'm going to sidetrack you for just a moment. I'm going to take you to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter uh, 12, verses 10 to 14. And I think, you know, because it's a little lengthy, you might want to turn there. But even if you don't, I will be reading it to you. Chapter, verse 10. Yes, 10 through 14. And it should be on your cross references. There's no 14 on it, just 10. No 14. No, okay, sorry, it should say 10 through 14. Yeah, it's on the, it's on the previous page. Oh, okay. Right so it probably got repeated with verse 10. But that's okay. As long as you've got the start, you can keep reading. That won't be a problem. The reason why I'm taking you there is oh, okay. in Zachariah. Zachariah. We have a picture of what's called the second advent, or a word that we're more familiar with, the second coming of Messiah. Okay, let me just say quickly, without going into detail, I'm not speaking about the rapture. The rapture is not the second coming of our Lord. When he came the first time, first coming, his feet stepped all the way down on earth. He walked in Israel. He died in Jerusalem. He was born in Bethlehem. I should have started with his birth. <laughs> born in Bethlehem, died in Jerusalem, raised from the dead, and ascended into heaven, all from Jerusalem. But his feet literally touched this earth. He walked among the people. He talked with them. He ate with them. He slept with them. In his human form, he was tired. He was hungry. He had needs. In his godly manifestation, he had everything and was everything that God is because he was fully God and fully man. Now he told his Talmudim, he was following through, had been given to them from the beginning, that there's a coming kingdom for Israel, that Messiah will sit on David's throne, that there will be a liberal time of peace on earthly Jerusalem. That's the second coming, when he comes again to Israel, when his feet come down on the Mount of Olives, when they cleft that, that mountain in two and, and the whole valley opens up and he sets up his millennial kingdom. Revelation 20 gives us the word millennium six times in 13 verses. If God says it once, it's important. By the time he tells you it six times, take him at his word. He's telling you something. There will be a thousand year rest for Israel and all the nations as they come up to Israel because they also will receive blessings. That's in second coming. Rapture is what's been given to the body of believers, the called out assembly, the ecclesia, the church. Okay, in our age of grace right now that we're living in, that we see that both Jewish and Gentile can uh, be brought into a right relationship with Father in heaven in the same way through the shed blood of Yeshua on the cross, believing in him for salvation, puts us into that family that I just described. We are given a precious promise also. And that's the promise that's given to us in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's given to us in 1 Corinthians 15, it's continued in 1 Thessalonians 5, it goes through 2 Thessalonians, it's a major theme in all Paul's writings to the people that were part of this assembly. 
This started in Acts chapter 2, after Yeshua had ascended to heaven, and the Spirit of God came, it came on the men, and they were able to, to speak the gospel in languages they'd never learned. That's the birth of what we call this church, it's called out assembly. And this is a group that God has promised spiritual promises to. He did not replace Israel. He did not give them Israel's promises. He didn't say, you get the kingdom called, uh, the kingdom of David. You get the land called Israel. He did not do anything like that. He gave no room for replacement theology. And he gave no room for walking away from the Jewish people. He did not. He is Jewish himself. He's, Amen. he's coming for his people as he promised. But to this people, during this time, when it's completed, the last one comes to believe who's going to believe. And believe me, if we know who it was, we'd all be on like a vulture right now. <laughs> but God knows when that last one has accepted him, then he's promised us to call us up, to catch us up. He does not promise to come down to earth. He promises to meet us in wow. the air. He's coming for his saints. In second coming, when he promises to put his feet down on the Mount of Olives and set up the kingdom I just talked about, he's coming with his saints. If you keep those two little words, prepositions that are critically important, the for and the with, you'll keep it separate. And you'll see God has two different programs. One way of salvation. He's the mastermind of the whole plan. But he has a plan for Israel that will give Israel earthly blessings, as he promised from Abraham even before that. And he has promises that he's given to this called out assembly, this group that under this time that's called grace. When we're not saved by law, but we're saved by grace. We're not saved because we keep the law, we're saved because we put our faith in our Messiah and Savior. The law didn't save them either. It pointed them to them that they failed, but it gave them the sacrificial system to give them the picture of salvation. They put their faith in the sacrificial system. Would they understand? Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Proverbs 30, verse 4, many other places. They would see he's the sacrificial Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that Yochanan said, he'll take away the sin of the world. This is what they have not had their eyes open to yet, but this is what's going to happen in Zechariah. That's why I had to give you that background. Now we can jump into Zechariah. We can jump into some of my favorite verses because I love seeing what God is going to do. It thrills and encourages my heart. And in the midst of today's circumstances, we need to keep our eyes on the Word of God. He is faithful and He will fulfill everything He has said. So, to the people called Israel, He has promised a second coming. Now, when we take that, because I'm sure you're saying, well, Rochelle, aren't we with Joseph in Egypt, why are you talking over here? <laughs> because remember how we have pictures that show us the greater picture? And here is a beautiful picture because we're going to see the second time the brothers met Joseph, mm -hmm. he's revealed to them. The first time Messiah came, unfortunately, our people as a whole, as a nation, not individuals, as a nation, they didn't recognize their Messiah. They expected King Messiah. They expected the throne. They expected the plan that I just said. And they totally ignored the scriptures that I also quoted to you of the suffering servant who would take away the sin of the world. So they didn't recognize him the first time. They left. They've come back down. They're before Yosef, their brother, the second time. And they're going to recognize who he is. And our land, our nation of Israel is going to finally recognize who Messiah is in his second coming. So we've got a beautiful picture here from Yosef to Messiah once again. We've seen what, 84 points I think, or maybe a little less, maybe I'm on 84 in my study. Yes, you're point 80. Okay. <laughs> yes, you're point 80. Is it, I, is, it could tie into it. You could call it that or you could just, um, because it, it, we're looking at the overall, you could just say this is the overall of these points. But here now, let's read and let's see what is said. God is speaking, and God says, I will pour out on the house of David, okay, David's house. Now, I don't think that's in Utah. I don't think that's in South America. I think that's in Israel, okay? Unless you doubt my word, it says, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Okay, we know who God's talking to, and we know where it's to take place, because God just spelled that out. 
So what's he going to pour out? The Spirit. Here's our triune God showing up because now we've got God the Father speaking and saying the Spirit's going to be poured out, the Spirit of grace and supplication. The Spirit is supplicating for our people even this day, interceding in prayer, taking our prayers, making them what they ought to be, and we see His Spirit poured out on individuals at this time. Can't wait till we see it as a whole nation. That will come in the future. But at this time, it's the Spirit of grace also. It's not what they've earned. It's not what they've deserved. Hallelujah. None of us get what we've earned and what we deserve from our God. But we do get His mercy and we do get His grace. We get what we don't deserve and we don't get what we do deserve. Hallelujah. I'll say it again. So that Spirit is, is the Spirit's been poured out on them. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit enlightens, informs. The Spirit brings understanding and clarity. The Spirit reveals who God the Father is, who God the Son is. The Spirit is working one with. We do not worship three separate gods. No. We worship one God who shows himself to us in three separate ways that is a mind blower to a human finite mind that cannot be in three places at once. But God's not confined. Hallelujah. He's God and he's amazing at what he can do. And here he's going to pour out that Spirit and he says so that they, who's the they? The inhabitants of Yerushalayim. The house of David so that they will look on me God's personalizing it they're going to look on me whom they have pierced and as I've asked many a time before when was God the Father pierced in the person of the Son on the cross pierced with nails pierced for our salvation they're going to look on him so they're going to look on Yeshua now we've got the Father speaking telling us what the Spirit's doing and saying they're going to look on Yeshua they're going to look on this one, and they're going to mourn for him. Now, why are they mourning? And that's M-O-U-R-N, for any of you who are not understanding my words. Mourn him. Why are they going to mourn? As one mourns for an only son, they'll weep bitterly. I'm sorry. They'll, yes, weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. If you've ever seen a parent lose a firstborn child in sudden child um, sits, they're heartbroken. There's no comfort. They, they've lost what the, was nearest and dearest to them. They're suddenly going to realize the firstborn, the only begotten of God, and I don't mean that he was birthed because God never was birthed, but in the form of the Son, he took on human form. He was born. He went into the womb of a, of a, a Jewish girl, and she gave birth, and he was born. And this one is the one whom they've pierced. Suddenly they're going to realize and understand Whoa! All that we've heard, all of that, all of that what's written for us in those Gospels, all that we were told through our Jewish writers, He was our Messiah. He is our Messiah. Eyes suddenly being opened to this truth, they're going to, to, to cry over the fact that they missed it, that they did not see it. But in that day, with this great morning in Jerusalem, like the morning of and I don't know if I'm going to say it right, Hadad Rimon is, is a place in the plain of Megiddo. Okay, the plain of Megiddo, Battle of Armageddon. Okay, Armageddon is a town also in Megiddo. We know now, when this is happening, the focus is going to be right there at Megiddo. When does that happen? Does that happen at Rapture? No. No, that happens at Second Coming. So now we know, we've got the time, we've got so much packed in this verse, it's just so exciting to see it all. It, it, right there and there was a great morning here before in fact the morning was so great before it's, it's saying that um, in verse 11 in that day there will be a great morning in Jerusalem like the morning of Hadron, Hadad Ramon I can't say it in the plain of Megiddo let me just tell you in short Josiah was a great king he honored the Lord he was young I, I'm trying to remember if he was our 8 year old I believe he was our 8 year old when he took the kingship and he honored God. When he was about 26, he said, there's something wrong here. And he took on all the idolatry in the land. And he kicked every bit of idolatry out. He put a stop to it. Even at this time, our people, there were those who were giving their children in the fires to Moloch. Mm -hmm. That's just as horrendous and as far from God as you can get. <coughs> he put a stop to that. He honored God. And God said he was a good king. He was, because he followed the heart of God. When he died, the country mourned. He brought them reformation. He brought them a breath of fresh air from God because he got them right with God. 
Sadly, the one who fell, followed in his footsteps fell from that and was an evil, evil king. And the country goes off finally into exile. I'm sorry, I just want to clarify just to make sure. Sure. So that, unfortunately, this would say that us who are grafted in as believers in Jesus Christ and salvation and grace are raptured up with him. Jerusalem is still going to have peoples left behind. You're going to have to experience all this. <laughs> and go through all this. Mm -hmm. We will come. And but there is that day coming when God, when the Lord himself <coughs> will put a stop to that and bring in and usher in that time of peace. That's what we ache for. Yes. But yes, and you've got it right. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I watch The Chosen, so watching the Sadducees and the Pharisees fight over the Torah versus the Daniel, the scripture, the other prophet sayings. The They're traditions. Just seeing it. They are. Just seeing it. They are. The veil of blindness is over their eyes. They have hearts that do not want to hear the voice of the Lord and follow Him because they want to call the shots themselves in their way. There's a lot. I haven't seen the, the program, what I have seen of it. It's been good, but I've seen very little. But So I can't talk exactly to it, but it sounds to me like they're right on, right yeah. there. And you wonder how they can miss it. But if you're trying to read something, you've got a veil in front of your eyes. Those of you who were praying for, for eye issues right now can probably really relate. You can see, and this, the deception that's coming out already is bad. By the time I get in the tribulation times, and I don't mean us, I should not phrase it that way because I don't want to confuse you. I'm not a believer in us going into that at all, and I'll stand on that by the Word of God and show you that in a whole other lesson because that's an hour and a half minimum <laughs> in the whole other lesson. But for those going through that time, the Scripture says, if it were possible, even the believers would be deceived. I can begin to see it now as the door opened to AI, and I, oh I'm, I'll tell you, yes, there can be a good side, but there's a very evil side with this. And I've already heard one that I know for a fact where he stands. And I've heard them put words in his mouth that sound like him and look like him, and that, that this is what he's now teaching. And I know for a fact it is not. Deception. Oh, my goodness. No longer can you say, well, a picture's worth a thousand words. I see you were there because I can put you where you've never been in a picture. And now with this ability to bring it to life, oh, the, what this world is going into, the deception will be that much the greater. But like Dr. McGee said, and I respect him as a great Bible teacher, when you drive into a mountain, you fall into its shadow before you get into the mountain. That's where we are. We're in that shadow of the tribulation, the tribulation being the mountain, and we're beginning to see what's falling on us. With that, and a willful heart that does not want to say, God, you're the one who's in control, and you should be on my throne, then they're easily going to have that veil over their eyes, and they're not going to read. They skip some of these scriptures. I've told you before that, that in the Hoth Torah, in the, the Prophets, they don't read them every single verse in order. They don't study them like we're doing. They study portions. And they don't know when they've stopped at Isaiah 52 and a while later they pick up at Isaiah 54, they're not stopping and thinking, hey, what happened to 53? That's how it goes on. You know, the many ways, in many ways. Saddam is at work. I can't wait till he's under Lord's feet forever. I mean, he's under his feet now, but you know what I'm saying. Till he's not allowed to run his his rampant um, plan that's going to come to a horrible end for him. And that's one I won't feel sorry for. <laughs> okay? Anyway, back on track. So this great morning, they, they, they understand. I love the way that the Jewish scriptures bring our Jewish history to our people's minds. They talked about this. They looked back at that time. Wow, we had such a great king. Josiah was such a great king. And they mourn for the loss of that great king. They're going to do this to that greater degree. Wow, we had the Messiah. He was here. We missed it as a whole. We didn't turn our hearts, but they're seeing that and they're opening our hearts at that moment. It talks about it in detail, and I'll just read it quickly. The land will mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David, their wives by themselves, family of Nathan, Nathan, the wives by themselves of Levi, Levi, the wives by themselves, the family of the Shemites, 
by themselves, wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself and with their wives by themselves. What he's starting to do is just lay down through the 12 tribes, but he's showing in both the civil and in the religious. That the same way we talked before about how Yeshua is going to be the one on the throne that is both king priest, both priest and king, sorry. He's going to have the government on his shoulders, Isaiah 9, 7. He's also going to be the deliverer, the redeemer, the Messiah that saves them. That's what we're seeing in this, that both lines, the godly line in the religious temple worship, the civil line in how people live their lives, all are going to be realizing we missed it in the government, we missed it in our, in our uh, temple. They're going to all come to have their eyes open to see the truth in that great day, and they will finally recognize the Messiah. And then we know they say, Baruch HaBaba, Shem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord says, when they say that, I'm returning. That's what we're reading about. With all of that in, in our future, we get a little snapshot of what it's going to be like as we come back now to Genesis 45. So let's go back to Bereshit, chapter 45, verse 1, and how is Yosef, and I can only imagine, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think we stop and think about the emotions of our Messiah. You know, he came into Jerusalem where he could oversee, and this was just about Palm Sunday, and he cried. He cried because he saw the people. And he said, if, if I were on my hand, I'd gather my chicks under my wings. He knew what was coming. He knew 70 AD was coming. But he knew before that, his crucifixion was coming. He knew how that was going to scatter the people. He knew all the calamities that were still going to come. And he cried. He feels emotion. He took on human emotions. He's in control. He doesn't lose control. But he feels the human emotions we feel. That's why when you go to him, go to his throne for mercy and for grace, he can relate. Who do you want to talk to when you're in something really difficult? You want to talk to somebody who's been down that path, who can say, hey, this is what helped me. This is what got me out of that. That's what the Lord can do for you no matter what you're facing. He suffered like we do as humans. Now take that human emotion, and he knows also I'm going to return. There's going to be a time that my precious apple of my eye is going to receive me. Remember the first time he came into his own and they received him not? Yohanan John 1 tells us that. This time they're going to receive him. This time, at this point, Yosef, verse 1, could not control himself before all those who stood by him and he cried. I want you to know from the Hebrew, he didn't shed a little tear. He didn't stifle something. He was so loud, they heard it through the palace, <laughs> okay? He let it out. I think it was building up, building up, building up, and it finally just exploded. He just let it all out. He could not control himself. The emotions got the best of him, as we say, and he stood and he cried, have everyone go out for me. He can't let all of Egypt know what's going on at this point. But he can certainly let his brothers know, and this is what he's about to do. Now, I can imagine in that moment what the brothers are going through, <laughs> seeing this. I mean, they had to been scared, speechless. And if they weren't before, they will be in a moment. In verse 2, we have, oh, did I finish one? I didn't. So there was no man with him when Yosef made himself known to his brothers. He sent out his servants, he sent out all the workers, he got everybody who belongs in the palace out of there. He wanted privacy. He wanted a special time with his brothers alone. And here's where he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. Okay, seven times we read of Yosef weeping. Seven times. Seven being the number of completion, I find it very interesting. But if that does not show you that he was a man of compassion, then nothing would. And that's our number 81, Yeshua and Yosef alike, being a man of compassion. But I'm not getting to the Pharaoh. We haven't gotten to the Pharaoh yet. No, what's in verse 2 that you just read? I haven't gotten to that far. I haven't gotten that far. I've just gotten with, he wept so loudly. I'll get to your next phrase in a minute. But he said, Pharaoh also heard it. Was he in the same building or something? I'll tell you because you're anxious, but that's the end of verse 2, and I'm in the first part of verse 2. <laughs> yeah, 
he, the cry was so loud that he was in the palace also, and the palace was hearing it. I can imagine it echoing through the chambers, okay? However it went, yes, they apparently did hear, or it could mean he heard of it, that the servants who were around that heard went and told him. Because the palace might have been so big, he might have been literally out of earshot, and we can't tell which way, but he is made aware he does hear or hear of it. I tend to think he could have heard it because it doesn't say heard of it. But, uh, but verse 16, I think, does. Look at verse 16 real fast. Uh, now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house, that Yosef's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. So it could be. It could be the report was taken to him. And I can imagine, you know, the, Yosef is their security. He's their leader. He's calling the shots. He's keeping things in order. He's feeding them. He's taking care of them. And they hear him wailing. Well, who are they going to turn to? We well, better go tell Dad. You know, the only one who's above him. So they take off to tell Dad. We're reading between the lines. It could be any which way. But I can tell you that if you want the seven places Yosef cried, we see it in uh, chapter 42 in verse 24. In 43 and verse 30, in 45 verses 1 and 2, and all of you get cross references. I wrote these out for you. 45 also verse 15, 46 verse 29, so that's coming, 50 and verse 1, and 50 and verses 15 to 17. And I can tell you the last ones are the tears he sheds when his beloved father dies. Okay, let's look real quick at 42.24, the first time we saw it, and I'll let you study, whoops, I'll let you study the others on your own, uh, just for the sake of time, because the point is, he understood sorrow, he cried, he had emotion, he was human, he um, had these, these feelings that let you know how much he really cared, and I got the wrong, what am I in, chapter 42.24, okay, 42.24 says, um, this is when Yosef's brothers were there, but he, he had seen them come in. He didn't tip his hand at all. He's got the interpreter talking between them, but he's seen his brothers for the first time in over 20 years, and he's caught by that emotion. And even right then, it says he turned away from them, and he wept. Then he returned, and he goes through all that we've gone through with his brothers you know, in preparation for today. So it starts with the emotion for the family, and it ends with the emotion of his father. I even see in that Yeshua, not that he does not care for beyond Israel, because we all know he does equally, equally. You know in second class and know in second generation. We're all loved by our, our God. We're all died for by our, our God our, through the Son equally, whether we are Jewish, whether we're Gentile, that's equal footing. He loves all equally, and the blessing is to go through the, is, the Israeli nation to the Gentiles. There's no exclusion there and there's no caste system. There's an equal love there. For God so loved the world. Okay? But we do see the emotion they had for his own. And we know Yeshua has emotion for Israel. And I can only imagine if our hearts are breaking right now with what Israel is suffering. What is our God feeling? And yet also, let's go back to Zechariah 10. And look at that also, when they're finally mourning for him, how that have to, has to excite him. How he has to, for 2,000 years, be living with this rejection as a whole. How overwhelming is it going to be when he returns and they're crying out for him with a love and a joy and embracing him and setting him up as King Messiah. I can hardly wait. Okay, so back in here, back on... Um, yes, I, just, I have to get back to that I noticed? Yes. So, um, I, I don't know if anybody else gets excited about this whole idea, but um, Joseph held himself together until the conversation went to a point where they unpacked all of the lies and secrets they mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. and, and finally said it all, mm -hmm. including losing Joseph and everything, because mm -hmm. they were afraid for the, for the father right. and how he would take that with Benjamin because he already lost one. Right. He, it, it waited till they had Fully. kind of almost repented or confessed everything. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
And I tried to bring that up before. If I didn't yeah. well enough, I'm glad you're making it come out loud and clear. Because yes, it's full repentance. They they are owning up to it all. They're not wiggling around and trying to blame someone else. They're not ignoring it. They're not keeping blind eyes to it. They are. They're fully realizing. You know, we we are sorry for what we have well, done. They, they partially opened up like that because they didn't know who he was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They didn't. Yes. I mean, if they would have known who he was. Let's find out how they do yeah. react because it is, yeah, that's what's going to come up in our story now. And it's, I'll tell you, we won't even get to the end of it because they're going to worry about it when Jacob oh, yeah. dies, too, you know, which yeah. is not yeah. till yeah. chapter 50. Yeah. So almost then, <laughs> but we're getting there. We're, we're actually getting there. So, but notice Joseph, okay, what's so overwhelming him? He, he's so thrilled to be embracing his brothers finally, but notice what's really the, the tip of the the whole, the whatever, the, the crescendo up there. Um, let me get you there, though. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. I got to back up because I think we missed something. Um, okay, no, yeah, I did. Okay, so the Egyptians heard it. The household of Pharaoh heard it. We've already talked about that thing. Still Loretta helping us. <laughs> so then Yosef said to his brothers, I am Yosef. Is my father still alive? Notice what's just, I, I'm sure his heart's just pounding. And they're shocked, believe me. Oh, they're yes. Oh, yes. They're reeling over uh, your I think they're, who? I think they're scared. I think they're literally, <laughs> I'm like, literally scared. Literally scared, scared speechless. Yeah, yes. for their life. Yes, yes. And, and they're not knowing how to handle it. But also at that same moment, if you've ever watched a story where you know a reunion is coming, what are you scared of? You're scared something's going to happen in that last moment and they're not going to get it. Okay, I'll tell you the bittersweet that's fresh in my mind is one of our four hostages that got released literally hours before his father passed away. Just hours before. They went to tell dad that they got him before he even landed in Israel when they, they knew he was on the plane safe and they found that his dad had passed away. That's what I think Yosef was thinking. I know dad was alive when they went home. Is he still alive? It's so close, and he's so afraid that something's going to ruin that last moment of ruining. Yeah, you forget how long that travel time takes. Right, that's right. Two Remember two we weeks. said yeah. minimum two weeks, could have been three weeks. Yeah, that's one way they kind of hang out for a while. Can just exactly, dad, and, and finish off so they needed the food, because that's the only reason why dad finally lets them go again is the need. So it's been a while again. You know, and, and then he had to go through all he did to get them to see where they're at with Benjamin. So, yes. So, it's possible the father knew he was released before he died, right? Not unless God told him. Because when they came to bring him the news, he was already passed away. So, and I have no idea his relationship with God, you know, I, I can't talk there. But... Um, it was, it was a heartbreaking moment to find it out. Many of the others, the, the rejoicing was there. You saw the mom who said her birthday was the next day. She got her birthday present. You know, there was a lot of, of rejoicing. But it is. And they also, I even heard one, the father of one speak, and he said, it's very hard. He says, I want to just openly rejoice. But he said, how can I do it when there's all of these others whose loved ones are still in, in captivity? He says, I can't do that. I can't. Yeah, I know that heartache. So, but here we've got Yosef. He's so excited. He's overwhelmed also. He's blurting it out. I'm your brother. Is dad still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. See, they were. They were absolutely scared, speechless. It says, for they were dismayed at his presence. Can you imagine them trying to let that sink in? You're who? You're what? And, and I'm sure they're thinking, does he look like my brother? You know, he looks like an Egyptian. How can he be our brother? You know, because he's total change of appearance. He's gone from a 17-year-old to in his 30s, or, yeah, late 30s, because it's, it's, by the time he sees his father, it's 22 years, okay? And we're close to that right now. So he's aged, he's grown up, but more than that, he's clean-shaven. You don't do that in Hebrew culture. You have the beard, you have the, the side curls and all of that. <laughs> He doesn't look like that. He's not been talking with the Hebrew tongue to them. He's been talking the Egyptian language. He's been dressed in Egyptian garb. He's sitting on an Egyptian throne in the middle of Egypt. Why would they expect this? Right. It had to shock them. It had to been all, you know, the whole gamut of emotions. And also, 
what will he do to us? Yeah. What will he do to us? He's we know what we deserve. He can do whatever he wants. To he can do anything he wants. He's yeah. second whip, and the only one who says no to him is Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh hasn't told him, you can't do this or that. Pharaoh's given him carte blanche. We saw that. So they are. They're astonished. Their consciences, I'm sure, are coming alive. Well, remember what we read in Zechariah 12.10, and that's why I've got just verse 10 down there, that, that when they saw him, they mourned for him. They have to be in that same shock as they're realizing, we passed up our Messiah. This was true. We didn't believe it. Oh my goodness, what we deserve, and yet they're going to find the same grace that Joseph is explaining to his brothers because they're coming to him with their eyes open and declaring him, who he is. Yeah, the dreams came true. <gasps> the dreams, they helped the dreams come true. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the disciples, because they were told what Jesus was going to do, but they didn't get it till later. Right, right. right. You know, we, we sit in judgment, but we've got to remember, yeah. we got the whole story. We've got the chance to read it again and again and again and again. We've got the Holy Spirit within us to help us understand. And we've got someone teaching us that, except for some of us, like myself, privilege, grew up being taught it. So we heard it, what we could absorb as a child, and, and layers kept getting added. They're walking through it. They're in uncharted territory. They're not understanding this change. And that's why we also have such a hard time with the beginning of the church embracing how we bring the Gentiles in. How do we do this different? I hear people, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I hear people all the time say, oh, Peter, he was terrible. He was, and what's the word I want? Um, uh, um, Anti-Semitic in reverse, anti-Gentile, okay? I can't think of the word I want. It'll come back to me in a moment. But they miss what's happening in that, that dream that God had to bring, let down the sheep and show the kosher animals and the non-kosher animals and that you could eat the non-kosher animals. And, and Kepha, his answer to the Lord is, no, Lord, I would never do anything that dishonored you. I'm a good Jew. I'll keep, you know, I, I, I don't want to get out of line. He had the right heart. He wasn't understanding the change yet. And God had to break down that change. There's a new way now. There's something different here now. And I applaud him because he got it pretty fast. God showed him that vision three times all at once. And there's a knock on the door. And he's going the next day and he goes into a Gentile house, which would not have been allowed, not because they thought they were superior, but because they were taught you don't associate with the heathen. You stay pure. You stay clean. So all of this was a whole new way of thinking for Kepha. And did he have trouble with it at times? Yes. Paul got on him at one point because... He was being two-faced. I'll be this way with them, but I'll be this way with them. And Paul had came to him and said, no, 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 no. If it's right in here and now with them, it's right over here also. You don't do this back and forth. But it was a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way to absorb. So when you get into the, the mindset, you get into all this, you begin to understand. And yes, I agree, the Talmudim, his disciples that were following him, as Ron said, they were confused. They weren't getting it. These brothers are confused at first. But you know, we, thank you, Shadow. That was the amen. <laughs> we see many types that the deliverer in Scripture. Yeah, we've, we've got somebody walking the dog, and she's got to protect her territory. I'll let, I'll let Roger get her quiet if it works. Come on, sweetie. <laughs> oh, Roger, no, my son. <laughs> <laughs> Such is life in this neighborhood. <laughs> okay. Many times in Scripture we see that the deliverer is rejected the first time. And then the second time there's a revelation. Okay? So this isn't anything totally, you know, totally uh, bizarre. Shall I put it that way? Let me give you an example. Look at Moshe himself, Moses, okay? Go with me to Exodus 2. Shmote chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2. And this is his first time, okay? The first time that he's presented to them. Chapter 2 and verse 11 says, Now it came about in those days when Moshe had grown up that he went out to his brethren 
he looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Okay, drop down to verse 12. Maybe that we were there. So he looked this way and that. When he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian, and he hit him in the sand. He killed him, and then he buried him in the sand. Okay, he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the fender, why are you striking your companion? Hey, this is your brother. Why are you fighting with your brother? But he said, the one that, that Moshe talked to, he said, Who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Uh-oh. Word was out. They saw. You know, Moses thought he'd done it in secret. He was caught. Now he's afraid and he ends up running because he's scared what's going to be known. But notice how they took after him. They didn't see him as their defender. It's like, who are you? You, you think you've got a right to talk to us? You know, they, they were not accepting him. We know that God raises them up as the Redeemer that takes them out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, and into, up to, up to the Promised Land. Yahshua takes them into the Promised Land. And why is that? Because Moshe represents law. The law cannot save. The law could not deliver them into the Promised Land. The law could bring them and show them their failure. Yahshua, the name that means God saves, was the one who was able to take them into the Promised Land. That's why there had to be a change there also. And let's look at Yeshua. Because the first time that he spoke, he was rejected. Okay, go to Numbers 13. And we're not going to read all of this, but I just want you to glance real quick if you're wanting to look at the scriptures. If not, I'll tell you what I want you to see. i got to spell it right Number for my... 13. Numbers 13, yes. You can read the chapter on your own. It's, it's too long for now, but I'm just going to get us started there, and then we're going to jump into chapter 14. So... What do we have happening in 13? The Lord Adonai spoke to Moshe, saying, Send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. You'll send, you shall send a man from each of the father's tribes, everyone a leader among them. So if you all know now, you're with me. This is when the 12 spies went into the land. They spied out the land. Ten spies came back and said, There's giants in the land. They'll eat us up. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb, Joshua and Caleb said, "The bread and butter for us. We'll eat them up. Our God will give us victory." Sadly, they went, the nation went with the ten and not the two. They rejected Joshua. They rejected Caleb, and they paid the price for it. They spent forty days in the land spying it out, coming back with that bad report, scaring the people and turning them away from God, who was faithful, who said, "Right here, I read it to you. I'm going to give you the land." That's all they needed to hear. God said, I'm going to give it to you. They should have said, we can take care of anything in the name of our God. And they should have gone forward. So 40 days they spied out, came out with a bad report. One day for every, one year for every day. They're going to spend 40 years wandering the wilderness. The generation that would not believe will not receive the promise. And they die off before Yeshua is able to bring them in. But we do see in chapter 14, I believe it's in 14. I've got that marked down, so I must... And that's where I was going. We do see, um, well, verse 6. Yeshua, the son of Nun, and Kalav, the son of Yathuna, of those who had spied out the lamb, they tore their clothes. Okay, that was still where they're, they're rejected. It's got to be in here, though. If not, keep reading and it will come. Um, okay, I'm not finding it fast, but we all know. Yeshua does take them into the promised land. Kalav goes into the promised land. They're the only two in their generation that survived the 40 years of the wilderness. The only two that went into the promised land. All the others that were 20 and above, because that's the age that God held responsible in that setting, they all died off in the wilderness. And that's but, really sad because you would think back after what God has done. After coming through the Red Sea, seeing the Egyptian army hard. drown, getting mom to feed them, Everything being taken care of. That's why I think God held them so severely with a consequence. Because everything was there for them. But the second time, they do accept Yeshua as a leader. They follow him when Moshe dies. They follow him and go into the promised land. Are they symbolic of the two witnesses in the tribulation? Are they symbolic of the two? I don't believe they are the two. No, no. But are they symbolic? Um, but are they symbolic? It's supposed to be I see some I can see some parallel. I'm not quite ready to say symbolic, but I definitely can see parallel. Okay. Yeah, I'd have to think it through to say to come to a point whether I could see total symbolism or just parallel. Okay. Just 
familiar, similar. But definitely similar. Yeah. yeah. Were yeah. you trying to find um, numbers 14, 36 through 38? Is that it? Thank you. I'm where, sure you're right. Where it names the two? Oh, maybe so. And the others have died. Yes. Okay. So there we go. Yeah. So go ahead and add into your notes verses 36 to 38. You have that the two that remain alive. And if you keep reading in the scriptures, you go into Yahshua, the book Yahshua, Joshua, you'll find that that's when he begins to go in victoriously. In chapter 1, when he's dealing with his fear because he's feeling the whole weight of, I'm the leader now. You know, he was, he was great as Moshe's right hand, but now it's on him. And God says, you know, be strong, be, be well, read Joshua 1, 9, I love the verse, and I'm, I don't want to slaughter it like I'm doing right now. But uh, this is encouragement to anyone, any battle that you're facing, you can, you can read this verse and encourage your heart in it. Yahshua 1.9. Well, I like that scripture in number 8. You want 8 too? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll read 8 too for Loretta's sake. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. And I will tell you, if you've got needs, be in the Word of God day and night. If you don't have needs... Be in the Word of God day and night. <laughs> Believe me, it's strength, it's breath, it's food, it's nourishment, it's everything you need. And he's telling them here so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Forgive me, Anne, but that's your verse. Mm -hmm. I love those verses. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, okay. that's very fitting. Okay, uh, that's very fitting for what's going on around the world today. Isn't it? Sure it is. Isn't it? And why I said I have to run into the Word of God and I have to keep my eyes on the Lord because otherwise I would be in a panic for my beloved nation. Because we but always God have, is in control. We always have to realize that this is the plan. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's not God's oops and Plan B. This is Plan A, and there is no B. So and when Jesus was weeping over the people in Jerusalem. Oh, it was just a he knew the heart. Holocaust was coming. Yes. He knew the stuff yes. that's going on today was coming. Yes. He knew the tribulation yes. was coming. Yes. And he knows everyone who is dying in rejection of him. And that's probably part of the reason why he prayed, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeah. Yeah. What a heart. What a yeah, heart. And, and what love. Also, is, is, uh, your sin does find you out. There's pastors. And that's the, the two of them. Just keep them in prayer because they're human. They're family. They're human. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's so what I don't understand is, is if God forgave one 40 years ago, and it comes up now. I can't answer. I don't know circumstances, and also being on video, I want to be very careful what we say. That's but okay. but God may be working a bigger picture in their life than what you're being privy to. Yeah. yeah. Or it could be AI stuff too. <laughs> this is true too. That could be yeah. Yeah, you have to, and don't be quick to condemn. I hear, I hear people all the time when I have roast preacher for lunch on Sundays or Saturdays, depending on which day you go. But it's for the family and for them. Yes. And his church. Yeah. Okay. David's another example. Okay, his father sent him to his brothers. They saw him coming. They were angry. He came to to just make it worse for them, not to help them. Years later, his brothers receive him as king. So we see the contrast there also. You can read that in First Samuel, First Samuel, chapter 17, verses 17 through 19, and verse 28 is where they're rejecting him, where they're saying, "You just came, you know. You're just you're you're just calling us out, you know." You're 17. It's in your cross references. Yeah. Um, and I didn't put down when he becomes king. You can look that up on your own. <laughs> okay. But so we see this example. They're all, it's not always the first time that the deliverer is accepted. But we do see it on that second time they realize and there is that exception. So, again, let's go back to our brothers because their minds are spinning and they're trying to grasp hold of this and trying to understand it. And poor Yosef is waiting to hear, is my dad still alive? Is he still alive? You know, you can imagine the separation he's felt because he was very, very close to his dad. And it's been all of these years. He probably never thought he would see his dad again until the brothers came into his life. And now he's had that inkling of hope that he had to get through this time process too. 
So going back to, to chapter 45, and I shut my Bible out. Verse 4. Yes, verse 4, as soon as I can get there. Sorry, folks, there we go. Okay, so um, so they're silent. They, they can't answer. They're dismayed in his presence. They're trying to figure this all out. So Yosef said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer. You can imagine, again, are they thinking, you know, do we need to run? Are we about to be killed? You know, and he's saying, no, come closer. He's inviting them now to reconciliate with him. He's showing them his love to them, and he's wanting to put his arms around them. This is number 82, because this is what Yeshua does. The, the, those of his brothers who have rejected him, those of, of his brothers who have turned away from him, when they will look to him, he does not say, oh, you blew it, don't want you, don't get near me, you made your own bed, you line it. No, he says, come, come, come all of you. Come and eat for me. I'm the one who will feed you. Come for what you need. Come to the waters, I'll refresh you. He wants to put his arms around them. And as he opens those arms to receive them, they'll see the nail pierce hands. What love, what love. Look at Isaiah. Look at Yeshiahu, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54 and verses 7 and 8. For a brief moment, God says, I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now for all replacement theologists out there, let me put this in the right way. When God said that he forsake for a moment, how, how does it say, I hid my face for a moment? What he is saying is when he had to allow them to go into captivity, when he has to allow them to go through the tribulation, that's when they're not seeing his face. His face is hidden from them. It does not mean that he's turning away and rejecting them. Amen. He's just lifting off the hand of protection. Could that if, also have been the 400 years of silence? Could be, yes. Could be. Yes, and I can just tell you, if God gives you an umbrella for protection, whose fault is it if you get wet? <laughs> who took you out from under the umbrella you did it to yourself and when you're out there you're hollering I'm getting wet and God's saying well come back in come back in he's never denying mm -hmm. he hid his face but that's kind of what Joseph did too when they first got there true he hid his face he but didn't tell them who he was no yeah. no but, and he didn't make he it didn't easy on them in the beginning. He He's testing them, them to yeah. see their hearts. And he hadn't rejected them. Right, right, right. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And look at 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, written by a good Jewish boy. Sha'al Paul, if you don't know. Verses 19 and 20. Namely, that God was in Messiah. Anytime you see Christ, that's the, the Hebrew behind it is the word Messiah, okay? It's not his last name. He's, he's not Jesus Christ like I'm Rochelle Pearl. That's his name is his position. He is Yeshua, the anointed, the anointed one of God. So when he says here that he is namely that God, the Father, was in the Messiah, reckless, reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them. Hello, replacement theologist, and I'm sorry, yes, I'm on my soapbox because I do so much damage for my people today. God said, I'm forgiving, I'm not counting their trespasses against them. He never says, I'm done with them, I'm wiping them away. He never gives room for that, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Who is he giving that to? To all who come to faith in him. They can be reconciled. Joseph didn't pick out and say, well, I'll forgive Reuben, but I'm not going to forgive Judah. He didn't say, well, I'm going to forgive. Benjamin wasn't even there. So Benjamin gets brought in. And, and, and Naphtali, we haven't heard much from you, so I'll bring you in. No, no. Joseph brought all the brothers in, the ones who cried out for his death, the ones who said, yeah, let's sell him. And the ones who did it, they're all being reconciled with him. Rochelle, if God couldn't forgive Israel for what she had done, then and he turned him. his back on her, then how would he have been, we have the assurance that he wouldn't turn his back on us? Exactly, too? exactly, mm -hmm. absolutely true. And, and honestly, as a whole, and again, I'm not talking individuals, but as a whole, 
the church has done no better than the nation of Israel did. Yeah. Is the church on fire through this world serving and pleasing and following the Lord and, and keeping his word, being obedient and presenting him to the, the rest of the world? No, not as a whole. Sadly, not as a whole. Individually, yes. Individual churches, yes. The church of Philadelphia, alive and well on this earth. Hallelujah. But the church of Laodicea is alive and not well on this earth also. So, yes. And, and we never read God rejecting the church either. He receives us in. He is the great forgiver. And that's what we see all the way through scripture. It's just amazing grace. Now, notice what Yosef says because it fits perfectly with what we're saying also. Back in verse 5. He's called him in. He wants him closer. He wants to be able to have him. We're going to see that. Um, I guess I didn't finish for it. And he said, I am your brother Yosef, whom you sold into Egypt. He leaves no margin for, I'm somebody else. And he doesn't let them off the hook saying, I don't remember what you did. No, I am. I'm the brother you sold. But he's saying that because look what he's going to tell him in verse 5. Oh, yeah. Now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Okay? Don't go there. Don't go there because that's not the true picture. Here's the true picture. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Yeah. He just took the guilty sentence off their backs. He just said, take that away. You think you did wrong, but you've got to understand God's the one that was ahead of it. Yeah. God sent me. And he sent me so that life could be preserved. Wow. He took that whole ugly burden of guilt away from their shoulders. And he was always... He passes away, they take it back again. <laughs> and he was always giving God the credit? Yes, when always. He, when he told dreams? Yes, it the, was God. To the God. Cupbearer and the king and everybody, he yes. was always putting it... Yes, on God. God. It was God. from God, yes. He never took the glory to himself, no. And in Ephesians 1, 11, the second part of the verse tells us that God works all things after the counsel of his will. Mm -hmm. That's what is, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter how you've been wronged in this life, whatever it is, you think that impossible mountain, here's our God. And he says, oh no, 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 no. They didn't do that to you. I've been ahead of this, and here's what I want to bring out of this. God is amazing. And he can, he bring, is. He can bring family together no matter what the storm was. No matter what. No matter what. Just put your eyes on the Lord and watch the change. Watch the transformation. And again, again and again, and I know you're with me, but this is not plan B. God didn't say, oh, they did that. Now what am I going to do about it? Oh, okay, I'll do this. No. No, Joseph made it very clear. You thought you were doing it. God did it. And this isn't the first time. I mean, this is the first time he says this. It's not the last time. Okay, keep, keep listening. Let's see if we get far enough we get all the times he says it. Verse 6, okay, and, and keep reading. I love the input, you know, be, be with me in it. Let it come to life. Okay, God sent me before you to preserve life for the famine has been in the land these two years and there are still five years in which there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. Remember, they didn't know that. Yosef knew it because of Pharaoh's dream and God giving him the interpretation. But that dream didn't go all the way to Israel and they weren't being told, oh hey, get enough food for seven years and hide out. No, but God knew their needs. God knew he was bringing Israel down into Egypt. We're going to talk about that heavily because that's what's going on. That's the greater picture here. You think you did this. You think you brought this on. You think these consequences and these circumstances are because of you? Ha! I have news for you. God was ahead of you. God's done this to preserve life. He has brought you down because there's going to be five more years of famine. You're not going to survive up there. So he's bringing them down. He reveals himself to his brethren, and he brings them down to where they'll be taken care of. Now, the closest and the only thing that I could get, maybe symbolic of these years of famine in Egypt, is what we see in the beginning of the millennium. Egypt lies in desolation for 40 years in the millennium. Now, 40 out of 1,000, maybe we can compare that to five years here, okay? Um, but we see that. Let me show you that, because God does not take... Um, the, the countries that he uses to bring Israel to her knees, that, that child train her, 
he doesn't let them off the hook. He doesn't say, well, you were allowed to do bad because my children need to be corrected. He goes after the ones who do bad because they were not to do that either. And so Egypt does suffer consequences for her actions against Israel. We'll see in the tribulation when we study that. Egypt is no friend of Israel in the tribulation. We have hints now that it's not as bad as it's been in the past, but it's not as good as it's going to be. I mean, well, it will finally be that good but initially. So look with me at Ezekiel 29. This is uh, uh, Ezekiel 29, verse 3. Ezekiel talks to us so much about the tribulation, um, the battle of Armageddon, the dry bones coming back to life. We love that chapter. Uh, yeah. But chapter 29 and verse 12 says, So I will make the land of Egypt a desolation in the midst of desolated lands, and her cities in the midst of the cities that are laid waste will be desolate 40 years. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the lands. So for the first 40 years during the millennium, Egypt is scattered. Egypt isn't a people in her, in her nation. She's, she's reaping what she has sown, but is, is also being meted out with grace. She is in the millennium, and she's going to come back into a right way where she will come up, she will worship at the temple, and her land will receive rain also. Joel, Joel Yoel also speaks to this. Um, chapter 3 and verse 16 is where we'll start. Joel, or Yoel, chapter 3 and verse 16. Where we read, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth tremble, but the Lord is a refuge for his people, a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. Strangers are the ones that keep it. No more. It's going to only be believers that come in. Anytime you read in Scripture where it says, then you will know that I am the Lord your God, and it's talking about people knowing it, I can tell you right away, put that in the millennium. That's just a helpful hint for you. That's why I don't see a two-time war with Russia and with other nations because Ezekiel 38 that they want to put pre-early or mid-trib, I can't see that because repeatedly in chapter 39, and they will know that I'm the Lord your God, and they will know that I'm the Lord your God, and it's referring to the nations. <coughs> the nations will know I am the Lord your God. They will know I'm the Lord your God. I can only see that happening when the millennium finally comes. Mm -hmm. I do not see that coming ahead of time. Okay? I am a minority voice. It doesn't matter to me. I have to see it in the Word of God, and I have to tell you what I see in the Word of God. So what I see is Uganda. <coughs> they had hostages. They held them captive. The whole world paid attention. But how many people said, oh, that's the God of Israel that rescued those hostages? Mm -hmm. The world didn't know. The world didn't say, oh, wow, we better worry about the God of Israel. Look what he's doing. There were some who said that. There's always some who, who are brought to faith in these circumstances. But when it's talking about the nations knowing, mm -hmm. that to me is indicator, boom, right there. That's what comes out of Armageddon and into the millennial kingdom. Who had their hand up? Loretta. Judge Ed, we caught on Ezekiel 36 and 38. Man, was it powerful. Mm -hmm. And he had the maps, the scriptures, everything like you would. And I, oh, I had it. I will go look in the archives. I did not hear him. I will go look in the archives. I, I highly respect him because he's a man of the word of God. Yes. You know, this is your litmus test for your pastors. And I'm not here to take anybody down. No. It's not me. Okay? But the word of God. That's what you want in a pastor. You want him in the word of God, preaching the word of God. When I'm speaking, I'll tell you, I'm on my sandbox. <laughs> you hear me say it. But I want to give you the Word of God. It, when you go out that door, forget everything Rochelle said, and hold on to everything that God said. That's what matters. And that's the only thing that matters. And what's great is he has more that he's been teaching on. He's, and yeah. he has a, a friend that came from Israel, Jerusalem. Man. That's on there. The history that he's been teaching. He went, he said, I want to build my people to learn the truth and to build their faith so that when he comes, you're ready. 
Do I know what this little Jewish girl wants? She would love to just be in the back seat of the car when Jack Hibbs and Amir are running around together. Yeah. <laughs> and just listen. Just let me be a little bee on the wall. You know, just listen. You know? yeah, really. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back on track. Um, and, and again, you know, I'm very careful about who I will encourage you to listen to, but I will appoint you to anyone that I believe that goes to the Word of God and teaches you from the Word of God. Yeah, Is it perfect? Is. No. None of us are, you know, and I'm not holding myself up on Jack's level, believe me, I'm not, but I'm just saying that's, that's your litmus test. Am I in a good church? Does the church preach the Word of God? Does it tell you to get into the Word of God? Does it give you the Word of God for your whole guide and compass and everything? If it's anything else, run. Go and find that, the and church. That's why that's you need it. to be familiar with the word so that you know when they're, you're being led the wrong way. Yes, yes. yes. And that's why you need to to use your own mind. God yes. never tells you to check your brain at the door. That's how Guyana happened. Jim Jones uh -huh. and all these who drank the Kool Aid because he didn't teach them to think. He taught them to only follow him. Just do what he says. Do what he says. Do what he says. And he made himself God in their lives. So when he told them, in essence, to commit suicide, they went right on, shoot to the slaughter. Use your mind. God gave you a good mind. Use it. Use it, use it, use it. Yeah. So. But you know, but then they said there was quite a few. Before they died, they, they fought against it. And they were those. were open. And they, they were those. They gave their hearts to God. They still died because he, he had his men force them down their throat. So Those are called martyrs. Anytime yeah. that we die in faith, for our faith, we're martyrs. Yeah. Yes. It's too late then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did I read all of Joel? If I didn't, I at least got you started, right? Yeah. I turned away from that. I'm going to think that I read you enough that it, it, it talks about the same thing anyway, especially verses 18 and 19, if I didn't. Um, I'm watching the clock, and I want to get us a little bit further, so read it on your own, but a lot of people have the false idea that the millennium is perfect. It comes into a very beautiful state, but at the beginning they are bearing bodies or bones. The, the flesh is being eaten by the, the ravens and the crows and all that. Body, bones are being buried. It, Egypt is desolate. There are other areas that are desolate in the beginning of the millennium. Um, judgment has fallen, and it, it doesn't end in that day. The judge, the consequences are there. But overall, it is a beautiful picture, and it goes into a beautiful picture. Sadly, at the end, we also have that that moment of horror when the the number as the sand of the sea follows Satan to come against our God, to want to dethrone the Lord after a thousand years of peace under Him. But He's ruled with iron. He's ruled with with truth and justice, it's not been a world like we're accustomed to where people get away with things. And Okay, I said not. Verse 7, I could go on. Verse 7, um, okay, so God's, okay, he said it in verse 6 already. Verse 5, he said God sent me. Number 2, second time, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Okay, verse 5 he said it. Verse 7, he's spelling it out specifically. You're going to be a remnant. He's going to keep alive a people of Israel. And we see God always has done that. There's always been the remnant. He's never brought them down to zero. And that deliverance, they're going to be delivered from being destroyed as a people and a future nation. God promised Abraham what would come from his loins. God promised Yitzhak, God promised Yaakov, and he's going to fulfill his promise. So he can't let the nation of Israel die off. Okay, they're about 70 people now. We're going to see that as we get a little further. But 70 people, thats you wouldn't call it a nation today. You wouldn't even call it a city. You'd call it maybe a little village. <laughs> you know, God's going to strengthen them. He's going to increase their numbers. But he is such a wise God. You know what's happening to them in Canaan? They're assimilating. They're mixing in with their neighbors. They're falling into idolatry. They're going the way of the ungodly line. And God's saying, uh-uh. I can't allow you to do that. I have to keep that godly line. I have to keep that remnant. So I'm going to have to take my precious little remnant, and I'm going to have to plant them temporarily in a place that they're going to be abhorred as a people. Egypt's going to go, ugh, shepherds. 
Oh, Joe's. Oh. Mm -hmm. So there's no intermarriage. They're not bringing their gods into their homes. It's going to allow Israel to flourish under their God, who is supplying for them, who has put them in the land of Goshen while everybody else is starving around them and they're getting blessed abundantly because he's their God and he's faithful to his word. I give you that because you all may not make it back next week. So come and see it happen, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, verse 7, God sent me. Two times we've had that now. Here comes the third. So I've got all three in one class. Verse 8. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over the, all the land of Egypt. Can you imagine their minds trying to absorb that? You're not blaming us. You're telling us it wasn't even us, even though we thought we had done it. You're telling us there was a greater hand that was at work. This is amazing, and you're telling us that God's done it for good, for something wonderful here, for grace. Their consciences have been convicted. They know that they were at fault, that God is taking that guilt from them. Isn't that what Yeshua does for us when he removes our sin from us? He doesn't say, clean up your life, get it right, present yourself to me as good and holy and just, and I might accept you. He says, no, come as you are. Come with your warts. Come with your, your sins. Come with everything ugly. Come with the conscience of saying, oi, gavot, how could you forgive me? Mm -hmm. And the Lord is saying, I will wash that all away. There's a cleansing for Israel coming also. Remember we read in Zechariah, Zechariah, we were in chapter 12, verse 10. Let me take you to chapter 13. And remember, chapter breaks are our dreams so we can find where we want everybody to, to see at the same time. But it was, Zechariah yes, Zechariah 13, yeah. verse 1. But uh, there, there, there's paragraphs, but there's not breakage. So the thought is continuing. And in chapter 13, verse 1, in that day, that day when they have seen the one who they recognize now as Messiah, they've mourned, their hearts are broken, their, their consciences are more than prick. They know they were wrong. They're crying out for that deliverance and for that forgiveness. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David. Remember, the spirit of grace is going to pour out on the house of David. And for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, are we hearing the same words? I don't hear it put the Gentiles in here. And I'm not excluding the Gentiles, but I'm saying God didn't turn away from Israel. He's telling him, when you finally have your eyes open, there's a fountain for you. That fountain's right there for you. It's in Jerusalem, and it's for sin and for iniquity. Yeah. Come as you are. How wonderful, because Israel, as much as I love her, will never get it right. She'll never get right before God on her own. Yeah. She has to come needing a Savior needing her Messiah, and she will the second time recognize him. And Hebrews 9.14 tells us, and I love Hebrews. Hebrews is it's such a good book. It is so Jewish, and I think it was written by a Jewish author. You can read between the lines. Hebrews 9 and verse 14 says, For where, oops, I'm in 16. Let me go to 14. How much more will the blood of Messiah who through the eternal spirit, Ruch HaKodesh, offered himself without blemish to Jehovah, God the Father. Do you see the triunity here? Is Zechariah and is Hebrews talking the same language? Are we talking about God, the triune God, being involved in our salvation, involved in the whole salvation of Israel? Absolutely. Here it is. Here is what he's saying, that, that through the blood of Yeshua, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. <sighs> Hallelujah. What a God, what grace, what a master plan. I can't say enough. Okay, what what a God. Just what a God. Let me just, just leave it there. What a God. Well, eventually Israel will realize that God never gave up on it. Yes. Eventually, she Through will. thousands of years, he kept. Yes, he kept coming. He kept coming. Yes, and he pursued. Yes, yes. I love to say when I see a, a Jewish one being witness to, time and time again, that the hound of heaven is on that one's tail end, <laughs> and that that's what's going on. Yes, and in the same way, God is just as faithful to bring in the Gentile, 
each and every one that will be saved. He will hunt them down also. He goes after them also, and he brings them in. And you're brought into the same root. You're brought into the same tree. You're grafted in. You, the, the grafting makes the tree stronger. You make Israel stronger by your faith showing them. Come back to your faith. Well, like you said, he loved the world, but he had a different purpose for Israel. Yes. And yes. the purpose to he has show for them the is world. something that all the rest of us should be very, very, very thankful for. Yes. yes. And Israel should be what she should be, which is a priest to the world, showing the world. And that's also what we're told as believers in this age that we are. We are priests. First Peter, Kepha says it, that we are priests. The holy royal priesthood of our Father to represent to the world the same thing. Where Israel didn't, we are to be doing that now. But not to exclude Israel. To bring her in also and then she will come back when she has it right into that place of uh, I don't want to say preeminence, but in that position to be the representative to the world. God's got an order. God's a God of order. That's all it is. It's just order. It, it, you, we're the ones in our finite minds. We're the ones that play this, oh, second class citizens. Oh, you know, you're the wrong color. Oh, you're, you're female and, and it's for the male or whatever. That's us. That's our sin. That's our worldly flesh. That's not our God. Okay, where am I going to wind up? Because we're supposed to be In fact, that's even there. Satan. He likes to divide yes. people up. Yes. You're doing it now. Like, yes. I look at diversity as being divisive. And, and it is. It's used divisively. And it's happening in a major way in this country as well as other places. Because when you're united, you're supposed to look at what you have in common, not what you have different. And we all need to realize it's one race. It's called the human race. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But there hasn't been that many um, pastors or whatever you want to call them that says, "Hey, we all are one." We all says, this church, black church, Mexican church, and everybody is church. And I never hear a pastor or a priest or whatever saying we're all one race. There are some that are saying it, but sadly, there should every one of them should be saying it. And everyone yes. should. Yes. Everyone yes. should. Yes. Should be out there. Yes, yes. And are there breaks coming? Yes. I can tell you, I can attest to one personally where when the work was started, being told you can't be multiracial, you've got to choose one. And now they're not saying that to that pastor, not saying that at all. So there are some breakthroughs, but sadly, sadly, and it is a tool of Satan to divide. It, it absolutely is. Because I want to wind it up, we can go back to conversation in a moment. Let's just get right here into our, our, our thought to complete our thought. I'm trying to say, see where I left off. We left off at 8. At 8, thank you. Okay, now therefore, it, that the third time, okay? The third time again, that it wasn't you who sent me, but God, and he made me a father to Pharaoh. Okay, he's like an advisor to the Pharaoh. That's why he's saying he's like a father to him. Pharaoh looked up to him like a son would look up to his father. Put him in charge of everything. That's what he's meaning in an advisory position as lord of his household. And if you have a house, it means household. And as the ruler in the land. So he looked at Yosef as a confidential counselor. I think Pharaoh was very glad to put Yosef there and have Yosef take over. And he's done well. He got them through the seven years of plenty with enough that they've gone into the time of famine. And he's seen the wisdom of Yosef playing out that this was for their best good. So I think I'll conclude with our thought. Um, Spurgeon was a, a, um, he was a respected preacher. Forgive me, Pastor Bill. He needs to be here to remind me the years. I, I'll i give you his years later. He's old. He's He hasn't been here for a long time, okay? But I love how he says this, and I'm going to read it because it'll say it better than I could. When, when, Joseph declared again, God sent me, not you, God, God did this. Spurgeon says, how wonderfully that these two things meet in practical harmony, the free will of man and the predestination of God. Man acts just as freely and just as guiltily as if there were no predestination whatever. And God ordains, arranges, supervises, and overrules just as accurately as if there was no free will in the universe. That's a mouthful. He said it well. We struggle with this free will and God's control, and it's in perfect harmony, and we see it played out here. Yes, the, the brothers had free will, 
God had predestination. They worked hand in hand. We see God's hand is superior. And we see that, that he is bringing together a, a plan far greater than if this had never started. Amazing, amazing. Yes, Laura. Uh, do you think it never says, like, Daniel, you know, when he was a prisoner, he kept his... Right. He kept kosher. Thing about the Lord and stuff like that, but it doesn't say anything like that about... We don't see that he was put to that test, so we don't know. But we know he stayed close to his God. He represented his God. We we don't actually, and I know he did sin, but we don't read of Joseph's sins in Scripture. And I think that even is to be a picture of the Lord also, because the Lord was without sin. So this is where Joseph wasn't without sin, but the Scripture doesn't reveal it to us. So in that, you know, the kosher laws were in in line we haven't had Moshe come with the laws being given yet but we know there was law there was God's rule there was God's way of doing it and I believe Yosef stayed a hundred percent with it that he showed himself faithful in every way and he did. yeah yeah but uh, yes and his wife declared I'm not the name of the kids if the servant was able to say you're God right right it shows that he he was emulating Yes, yes, and he was being a spiritual leader in, in that household that yeah. came to faith in the God of Israel. Yes, yeah, yeah good point, yes. And where we're going to leave it off is, and, and we'll leave it off with verse 9. Oh, okay. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, This is your son Joseph. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. We're going to have a delay, folks. Sorry, you got to wait a whole week before we get Yaakov reunited with Joseph, and I thought we were going to get that today. But I got too gabby, sorry. <laughs> but uh, we all kind of we did. Uh, and I love it because then I know you're with it and appreciating it and enjoying it. And that's what we're here for. We're not here to race through. We all know anyway. We know they get together. You know, I'm not leaving you on a cliffhanger where you have to wonder, does dad die before he gets down there? No, he's gonna make it all the way down there. Quick and comment. the reunion is so sweet. Just a quick comment. Yes. They should be figuring out really quick we're gonna have to tell dad what happened. Exactly. Ah, exactly. Yeah, that's be you're you're that's ahead of us. Joseph's still alive. They're going to say, um, what? Yes. What and and I'll tell you what you've got to think too. <laughs> Joseph hasn't heard yet what his father's been told. He doesn't know. Oh, yeah. He got sold into slavery. He doesn't know what the brothers told dad. Why he didn't come home. Yeah. Because as far as dad's concerned, he's like, oh my son died. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and unless unless the brothers have said that, did they say that last uh, week? Did we study that? Note. They may have, because they do tip their hand at one point where where Yosef does here. I think that was last week. They I have to say something correct. like one is no more. That's what they know. told him. What they told Joseph. Yeah. yeah. But I think if we look to last week's lesson, I think that the brothers do admit to each other, not knowing Yosef's hearing and understanding, um, something that that said. Um, Oh, where, where they're feeling guilty. Right, where they're feeling the guilty. Um, I'll go with, this is where I'm in trouble because I study ahead and then I don't remember where where I've studied to teach you guys and where I already have taught you. It, it gets blurred in my mind. Um, yeah, I, I don't see it fast. I'll look it up and we'll address that next week. But yes, there's there's your excitement to come back next week. What are we going to tell Dad? And I think it's Tevye in the dream. What am I going to tell you? Uh, Golda, another dream? <laughs> You've got to wonder, and actually, we're going to have to leave the, a bit of that question totally open because the scripture doesn't give us everything. It, it is a question that I got in my mind. At least I haven't found the total answer yet. But next week, come back. We'll have a grand reunion. We'll look at all the ramifications of it from all the perspectives from Dad, from the brothers, from Yosef, and again, I'll, I'll reemphasize why God has allowed this. That we'll look, take that with you this week. Take it with you. I know there's a lot of heart burdens in this room and in Zoom and and who will listen in the archives. No matter what you're going through and no matter how bleak it looks, realize God's hand is at work. Yeah. The invisible hand of God at work. Look at the book of Esther. You don't see the word God mentioned, and yet you cannot tell me that was not the invisible hand of God. A little Jewish girl in the middle of a Persian empire becomes queen? Mm -hmm. Really? Really? Well, that's about as likely to happen as 11 brothers being lined up by age. It's God.
So whatever you need, take that and cling to that. Your God is at work in your life. And, it, and in both cases, it saved a whole people. And it saved a whole people, yes. 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 And God will do it for an individual too, though. Don't think, well, I'm not a whole nation. Why would he care? He cares. He made you. He created you. And I honestly believe that he grieves over everyone that does not accept him. I, I honestly believe his, his heart grieves every time. I remember my two questions. <laughs> okay. I don't know which one of them you're saying. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let me close in prayer and you can bring them out, okay? How precious you are to us. Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, Jehovah God, our Father. Oh, how loved we are. And how thankful we are that you are so mighty that we cannot accidentally or on purpose ruin your plan. And may each carry with them how you are loving them, holding them, caring for them, providing for them, protecting them, that you are the rock of our salvation. And you will bring every single one of us all the way safely home. That it's not dependent on us and us getting it right and us being right. But Lord, in our thankfulness, in our hearts of appreciation, might we serve you and honor you and please you and be obedient to you. Hear our hearts, Lord. See the love that we have for you. Greater is your love, and we can only thank you for it. But grow us up in you, Lord, and somehow stretch us, because I don't know how you do it, but I love you more today than yesterday. Praise you, thank you, hallelujah, what a God. We stand in awe in your precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.